you can go push it for all I care. And I'm very bad at modeling. I had very different reference images for, for, for that episode. Actual chicken- Or! Or, or, or! Warning! This is my first tutorial I've ever made on anything that I've done, so if this is very complicated and not explained very well, I'm very sorry. This is gonna be a bit of an overview of how I make the Poke National series, but y'all know that I like to ramble about things, so here we go. Here is how I make my live-action Pokemon series using CGI, visual effects, editing, and more. God, I need a better title than that. How to make it the real-life Pokemon. Okay. Let's do it. The very first step in the process is of course, picking your Pokemon. Just as a side note already, I know a lot of people don't like the fact that I say Pokemon instead of Pokemon. To those people, I'd just like to say, I have this big boulder that Sisyphus gave me. You can go push it for all I care. Get it? Cause it's an effort in futility. Anyway, when it comes to picking your Pokemon, your choice actually matters a whole lot. While in their cartoony forms, Pokemon can be very similar to each other in design. However, when those designs are translated to live action 3D CGI, some become very easy and others become very, very hard. When I'm choosing a Pokemon for a video, the biggest variable that affects my decision is whether the Pokemon will be more challenging to me or not. For example, rock and steel type Pokemon are very simple to do within CGI. These days, making a recognizable rocky or metallic surface is as simple as slapping on a texture to something. Note, when I say simple, I mean simple for someone who is already an established CGI or VFX artist. I do not by any means want to imply that any CGI or VFX animation is easy. I don't think that should stop anybody from trying by any means. I'm just being concise because I don't want to edit an hour-long video about the two-minute animations I make. Anyway, back to the show. In fact, this decision-making process is why my very first Pokemon animation featured Magnemite and Geodude. Since at the time I was just making these animations for fun, I wanted to do something that would be simple that I could complete pretty easily. However, now that I'm working with Poke National as a full established series on the channel, I like to challenge myself every few episodes. For example, my recent episodes of Ghastly and Torchic were some of the most challenging ones that I've had in a very long time. This is because each episode featured smoke and fur respectively. Things like smoke, fire, water, or fur are very difficult in CGI. I'll explain why later. But for now, if you're someone who just wants to make a Pokemon animation like I do, rock, metal, or even skin are good. Fluffy, smoky, or gooey, not as good. So have you chosen a Pokemon? No? Well, we're doing Magnemite, so let's go. Once you've chosen your Pokemon, the next step is making a model. You could do this in any 3D software. I personally use Blender, but really any of them will do. Now, you could model all of this by hand. Or you could find a 3D model somewhere on the internet because people like to do that and it's very easy and I'm very bad at modeling. Seriously though, a lot of artists give out their 3D models for free and it's very kind of them to do so. Just remember to give credit somewhere in your project. Or, 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 or you could, I don't know, maybe like grab the 3D model directly from like the 3DS. I don't know how you do that unless there was like some specific website that I definitely have never heard of that gives away those 3D models for free that you could easily download and somehow just get to your computer. So if there is some way about that, maybe like comment it down below, but I wouldn't know at all about how to do that. So maybe if there's something like that, it would be really helpful to get those 3D models and then go from there. Import whatever you downloaded into your 3D scene and then boom, you have a 3D model to start off with. Now that you have that, we have to take this original design and transform it into a realistic one. This is where your choice of Pokemon already starts to matter. Every single Pokemon, no matter what, is based off of something in real life. So what you're gonna wanna do is go to Google and gather a bunch of reference images of that thing. For example, let's go see what Magnemite is based off of. Huh. Who would have guessed? But seriously though, you are gonna wanna get a lot of reference images just to get an idea of what this is supposed to look like. For a better example, look at Torchic. Of course, for Torchic, I had to look up baby chickens. This was mainly to get an idea of how a chick's feathers are grown and what they kind of look like, so then I can know that to apply to Torchic. And this works the same with every Pokemon, so make sure that you do it because it's kind of an important step. Because honestly, if you don't, you'll end up with a Charmander. I am. Um... I had very different reference images for, for, for that episode. <laughs> Once you have your reference images, it's time to start making it real. This can mean a lot of different steps that always depend on the Pokemon. For some Pokemon, I have to sculpt their shape so they look more realistic. For others, I go straight to texturing and focus on that. The best example though is from the Torchic video. I had the original model for Torchic and decided to completely delete its legs and instead replace them with the legs of an actual chicken 3D model that I had. So if you wonder why Torchic's legs look so real, it's because they're actually just chicken legs. This is a technique I like to call relying on reality. When in doubt, just use the actual real life thing whenever you can. For example, when it comes to texturing, you almost always want to use photo scan textures. Photo scanning is when you take actual photos of reality and transform that into CGI. I can't explain it well, so here's a tutorial on it. Go watch that if you want to know. But the general idea is to use as much reality as you possibly can. So real life textures, real life models, and yes, real life biology that you might want to look up to understand your Pokemon better. No 
knowing if your Pokemon is an herbivore or a carnivore can tell you how to design its teeth. Is your Pokemon a mammal or an amphibian? That tells you if you want to add fur or if you want to have more of a kind of frog texture or whatever. Are frogs amphibians? Are frogs amphibians? They are. They are amphibians. But you get my point. You can't transform something into reality if you don't know the reality first. But once you get done with all those steps, you'll finally have a fully realized, realistic Pokemon. But it can't move. So let's fix that. This next step in CGI is called rigging. Again, it's a bit too complicated to go into full detail here, but just understand, all you're doing is making little controls to move the character around. It's like puppeting with a computer, if that makes any sense. This is an important step to figure out though, because it defines how this Pokemon actually moves. This is again where we go back to reference. If your Pokemon has a real life animal counterpart, look up how it moves, and that can define how you make your rig. Does your creature's knees go forward or backward? Does it stand on its hind legs or does it use all four? Is the Pokemon you chose kind of human looking because then you have to look up how humans move and trust me you may think you know what humans look like when they move you don't until you actually like look it up and look at the details it's we move weird in fact i had to use the human version when i did the sableye episode and that was honestly way harder than i expected it to be like i said humans are weird okay but then follow some tutorials build some rigs and then boom you can now move your pokemon but now there's nowhere for it to move in Let's fix that. Environments. Now, admittedly, while I love making Pokemon, this is my bread and butter. I love building out CGI environments. It's just, it's my favorite part of the whole process. In fact, some of my favorite comments are people who think that the Pokemon is CGI, but the background isn't. Haha, you've been fooled by my amazing skill at making backgrounds look nice. <laughs> but yes, I learned a long time ago that it is a lot simpler to put a CGI character in a CGI environment that you can control rather than trying to superimpose it into real life footage. In fact, learning that lesson is kind of what started this whole Pokemon animation journey in the first place, but that's a story for another day. In the meantime, it's time to figure out where your Pokemon lives. I usually figure this out by going directly into the Pokemon games themselves and figuring out where to find these exact Pokemon. For example, the reason why you find Magnemite in a desert in my video is because you frequently find Magnemites in deserts in the Pokemon games. You also find them in cities, but I I'm still a bit scared of doing cities right now. Trust me, don't, don't, don't think I haven't tried. Cities are hard to do, man. Anyway, figure out where your Pokemon lives and what that biome is. Are they in grasslands, mountains, or snowy areas, whatever. Once you figure that out, start looking for, yes, more reference. Start researching those areas and figure out what types of trees, grass, rocks, all the things that fit into that biome. Then ignore half of it and download Quixel Megascans. There are multiple photo scan libraries like this, for example, Polyhaven, but I personally really like to use Quixel for a lot of my work. They have some of the best photo scan assets that you can get, but of course, there are other places where you can get them too, so collect as many 3D models as you can. Once you've downloaded way too much stuff, bring it into your scene and start designing. Before we do, there's one more bit of reference that I think we should collect. Yes, I know we're tired of reference images, which is why we're going to do reference videos instead. Go to YouTube and Google Nature Documentary. I personally use National Geographic for absolutely no reason in particular, but for our purposes, most nature documentaries will work. And here we just watch. When watching these, I want you to pay attention to two specific things. For one, what do the environments look like? Not exactly how they look like in real life, but how do they look like through the camera of the documentary? This is specific because there is very much a difference. And also, how is the camera moving? Documentaries are shot and presented in a very specific way, so understanding that is very important to recreating that. If you're not going for the documentary portion like I do, then you can kind of just skip this part, but it is important for if you want to do something similar. And it's also helpful for just understanding what the natural environment looks like around animals and other creatures. So, now that we got that, let's go back to the environment. Oh, hey, look, it's already done. You see, I create environments mixing Quixel's Megascans with Blender's Geometry Nodes. Geometry Nodes allow me to mathematically create a random chaotic environment that still looks good to the eye. An important thing to do when creating environments is to make layers. It's explained much better in this video that I found going over the exact same thing, but I'll explain it simply here. Essentially, making layers of detail over and over and over again allows you to create the chaos of the real world. It's not perfect, mind you, but it is a really good way to get very close to realism. For example, if you have grass, it will not be consistently uniform. Realistic grass is inherently chaotic and wild, so the size of each patch of grass has to be different. The grass can be rotated and bent in certain ways because ground is not inherently flat. You can also have different patches of specific types of weeds in certain areas. By adding these levels of details together, you can create a really good grass layer. And that's just for grass. This doesn't count trees trees, leaves, twigs, and all many other things that you can add to it. Again, go check out this video if you're more interested in the topic, but that's the essentials. Once you build out the environment, either by hand or using geometry nodes, you can now finally place your Pokemon in the environment. But the Pokemon isn't moving. 
So let's fix that. If your rig came out okay, then this process shouldn't be that difficult. The animation process is instead far more time consuming. But don't worry, I have a little secret that helps. Noise. And when I say noise, I mean a random value generator. See, noise is extremely important within visual effects. Seriously, ask anybody who uses After Effects what the fractal noise effect is and watch them gush for the next 20 minutes. Noise is very important and very helpful as a tool. What we're gonna do is go into Blender, select whatever part of the Pokemon that we want to move, and go over to the Graph Editor and Modifiers. Here, we're gonna add the Noise Modifier, essentially just adding noise to it, which makes it do this. What's happening is the computer is generating a random set of numbers between one and zero, and over time, it bounces between those numbers, creating this wave. If you fine tune the details, it can look like this. Do that to every part of the body, and then boom. It's not a perfect system. However, it does help create realistic movement, or at least realistic idle movement. The issue with noise is that it's not very active. It just keeps them bobbing in one place. In fact, I have a secret to tell you all. If you've gotten this far in the video, then I truly am thankful that people have supported me throughout all of the Poké National series and my other ventures as an animator. But it's time for me to come clean. I don't animate. I mean, I do, just not nearly at the level of an actual animator. I call myself an animator, but I'm actually much better with different skills within the animation process. I'm much better with lighting, environment design, and especially compositing. But actually making a character move realistically? Yeah, I'm still very far from being good at that. This little noise trick is something I've been relying on throughout the entirety of the series. The only times I didn't use the noise were the Ball Toy, Magikarp, and Mimikyu episodes. And I'll be honest, those animations look a little stiff to me. I'm getting better, and I am practicing, I promise. For example, the little head movements in the Torchic episode were my animations. I actually did place the keyframes and move the head and do all that stuff for that. But the movement of it bobbing back and forth and that type of stuff noise. And I don't want to make it sound like using noise isn't animation. I'm just admitting to you guys that I may or may not rely on it a lot more than I probably should. I just use it in place of the fact that I'm not as good as an animator as I want to be yet. And honestly, if you're a beginner animator, I'd suggest you use this a bunch because it's very helpful as a tool. In fact, my best use of this little noise technique, I believe, is the bee drill episode. You see there, I copy pasted the same noise function across the entire body, except for the head, of course. But after that, I offset that noise function a few frames. Doing this on different limbs made the movement look so good that I kind of just fell in love with using it as a process, but I promise I'm still trying to get better at placing down keyframes and doing the animation myself instead of just relying on math. Christ, that was a rant. Okay, let's keep going. You now have an animated thing in an animated scene. Now what? Well, it's time for lighting, of course. I will admit, I basically skipped shading. The reason is because we kind of went over shading in the modeling part, and if you use photo scanned objects for the scene like I did, then you just plug the texture straight into the object and you don't really need to worry about the details of the shading. Shading is important, I swear, but we're just, we're just gonna skip it. Lighting is a lot more important than most people assume it is. A scene's realism really relies on if people believe that the sun is in the place where the sun would be, or if a cave is as dark as it's supposed to be. So to understand this fully, we're gonna, uh, you know what I'm gonna say. Look up reference. Go back to your pictures of fields, forests, and whatever. What does the lighting look like in these shots? And to you, do they look realistic? This is important because a lot of images that you can find can be obviously staged. You don't wanna copy the images that are obviously fake. We're going for realism and only realism here, except for when we don't, um, I'll explain. You see, lighting something isn't always as simple as just adding a sun lamp to a scene and just boom, there you're done. I always like to start off with an HDRI. An HDRI is a high dynamic range image of a 360 degree area. Area. This allows you to get the lighting and the background if you want. For me, they're very helpful for adding clouds and background sky to a scene. Now, some people just add their HDRI and leave it at that. However, that's not going to be enough for us. You see, you want realistic lighting, but you also want to be able to feature your Pokemon a lot better. So this is where we start to flub the realism a bit. Rotate your HDRI to wherever you want in the scene, but then you're going to want to add a backlight to your Pokemon. This can be any type of general area light that your software has, but it's very important to put it behind the Pokemon. The cool thing about Pokemon is that there's silhouettes are extremely recognizable, so it's always easy to notice and recognize that Pokemon based off the outline that it has. Adding the backlight kind of lets people recognize the Pokemon immediately, even if they don't see all the details. You may notice that almost every single animation that I have, the Pokemon are backlit. Since you worked so hard on your model and design, you're going to want to make it pop out of the foreground. This also draws a viewer's attention to that Pokemon, so again, they can see all the work that you did. The interesting thing about the background being realistic is that you don't want people to pay attention to it. You want to 
to add layers and layers of detail and then hope that nobody notices that it's even there. The best VFX and the best CGI is always invisible. Things like lighting that focus on a very central object help cement this idea. But once that's done, your scene is mostly ready. Or you thought, because you still have camera animation to do. Remember when I said to research nature documentaries? Here's where that comes in. Know how those cameras are animated and know how those shots are made, then boom, translate that right over to CG. This is definitely one of the simplest parts of the process because you are just copying what you see. It's usually with this part that you want people to actually recognize that something is being filmed through a camera. I see a lot of CG artists make the mistake that they don't want the camera to be noticeable within the environment. This is an incorrect assumption. We live in a world where everything is recorded by somebody's camera. Knowing the properties of that camera, how it moves, how it shakes, how it blurs, all that stuff. What those details tell the viewer is that this is being recorded, aka someone had to film it with a camera, aka someone is actually there, aka it's real. By making the camera feel like it's in the scene, you make the viewer feel like they're in the scene. This is the same with camera effects, but we'll add those later. Once all that's done, your camera animation, your character animation, your lighting, and everything is solidified into something that you like, you can now hit the render button. But first, Set up your render settings. Now, this is the most important part to me that may not be important to everybody else. But as I said before, one of my best skills isn't in animation, but is actually compositing. And this step of the process is very important for compositing. If you're happy with the way everything looks already, then you can render your animation out as a PNG sequence. It'll be less taxing on your computer and definitely a lot less data to hold. But if you have an external hard drive and you really want to get into the nitty gritty of things, export as a multi-layer EXR. EXR files have all the light data you could possibly want as well as the multi-layer bit. This allows you to have a bunch of different render layers that you can use in compositing. Oh, and also remember to check your color space. This is also important for compositing, but eh, not many people really talk about it that much. So for now, don't worry about it, but just know that I like to put my color space in ACES CG. Okay, now actually hit render. <laughs> Isn't that great? We're over 50% of the way through the process. That's right, after all that work, we're barely past halfway there. God, I love what I do. So next step, compositing. Like I said before, if you rendered out as just a PNG, you don't have to worry about this bit. But if you're cool, like me, then let's get into it. Choose your compositing software. Technically, you could do this in Blender, but I like to use DaVinci Resolve Fusion. You can also use After Effects, but I mean, Use DaVinci Resolve Fusion. Not that After Effects is horrible by any means, I'm, I'm just saying I'd rather use Fusion. Or Nuke if you have it, but I can't afford that right now. Once you have your software, bring in your multi-layer EXR sequence. And if you thought all the other stuff we did was complicated, well buddy, you got no idea. I'm not gonna go over exactly everything that I do in here because it does get very complicated very quick, but I'll go over the simple stuff that's important for details. For one, color space. That thing that I mentioned earlier about being an ACES CG. Here are some other videos that I explain a lot better, but in summary, your color space is the amount of color that your image holds. And the color space you work in is the amount of color that you're allowed to kind of edit between. Making sure everything you're using works within the same color space is very important for VFX artists. For pure CGI, it's not as important, but it's still helpful. I use the color spaces to convert the animated image sequence into more of a footage-like type of thing. Essentially, when a camera is actually taking a video, it exports that video in a certain color space. With ACES CG, I'm able to convert my animated sequence into whatever footage color space I want it to be. This makes it a lot easier to edit like it's actual footage instead of some animated sequence that I just made. But before I export it, I do a lot of changes. I add effects like blur and JPEG damage to make the footage look a lot more real and a lot less perfect. The thing about real realistic footage is that there's always mistakes in it, so try to add as many really tiny, indistinguishable mistakes as you can. I also add things like distortion, chromatic aberration, and lens flares. I add dirt and grime textures to replicate a dirty lens. Again, all these things are used to make the scene look more realistic and look like it was filmed by an actual camera. Adding these types of imperfections are very important for realism. And of course, then I add things like film noise and whatever color adjustments I want to do just in case. And then finally, I render out that as a full video file. But it looks ugly and great. Yeah, 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 we're gonna fix it. You see, I export my stuff in logarithmic formats, which is technically not necessary, but I do it for a reason. You see, once I do that with a bunch of different Pokemon animations that I've done and put it all together, then instead of a bunch of animations, it kind of transforms my process into editing footage together. This is an important distinction because editing animation can be really heavy on a computer. So when you have it all rendered as footage, it really feels more like you're editing documentary B-roll together. This helps me get into the mind of an editor who's editing a documentary and putting that all together instead 
instead of just an animator. You focus on different things cut in different ways when you're thinking in that different way. Putting the footage together isn't too complicated, but it is a bit of cutting and splicing back and forth. You never want a shot to linger for too long. However, since I edit like a documentary, it is good to kind of have long lasting B-roll that's more relaxing for the viewer. Of course, at this point in the process, I'm getting my script ready. Yes, I know, I should definitely have my script done before I even start the animation process, but can you blame me? I just got into the habit and now I haven't been able to stop the habit. I'll change the habit eventually. No, seriously, I will. But of course, there's a whole process to writing the script as well. The way I start my script writing process is by going through research. Just like any documentarian, I need to understand what I'm writing about. For Pokemon, that leads me to going to a bunch of different Pokedex entries. For each episode I do, I try to include as much as possible from the Pokedex that I can. In fact, I frequently quote the Pokedex whenever I can throughout the videos. On top of that, I admittedly like to just embellish random details that I know from the Pokemon universe into the scripts. A lot of it turns into me writing Professor Ginkgo as a character, and I try to pull back from that and make it more just informative, but sometimes I have moments like the Magikarp episode where I like to have fun. Admittedly, a lot of the information that are in the videos just come from me googling things on Cerebi.net or Bulbapedia or whatever. Many people have left comments questioning the information that I have in my videos, and I just have to say, all of it comes from the Pokedex. I don't know if any of it makes any sense, and usually it doesn't, but that's where it comes from. Not to like diverge blame or anything, I just saying that I'm kind of just reporting on what it is, and I think it's funny that a lot of it is crazy ridiculous. But once the script is finalized, I get to sit down and record the whole thing. Since the videos are short, I only spend a couple hours recording audio. I have the tendency to make mistakes or stutter over my words, so I have to repeat a lot of lines. But once that's done, I edit it down. When that information is all set in stone, then I get to add in my footage, which again, is no longer animation, it is now just footage. An important thing I like to do with that footage is that I like to add realistic audio to it. A lot of animators make the mistake of not adding audio to their videos and it's extremely important for realistic animations. Sound is a very important sense that humans have, so being able to dial into it is very helpful for realism. I personally really like to use Pixabay to get all of my natural audio from. It's also where I got all of my stock footage that I use at the beginning of some of the Poke National episodes. Pixabay has free footage, audio, images, and a bunch of other stuff that are really useful for filmmakers. This isn't an ad, it's just it's a really great place where a lot of creators have come together and collaborated and shared a lot of the media that they create. It's really useful and I suggest that if you have any interest in video editing or photo editing or audio or anything, use Pixabay. It's a great place that's by the people for the people. But once I get my audio from that, I bring it into DaVinci Resolve and I edit it with my footage. And here's where we bring back our layers trick. That's right, the same layers idea that we use to make realistic backgrounds in the animation can also be used with audio. Layering multiple different audio tracks on top of each other can add to the realism of a scene. It can also help to blend how loud and soft different areas of audio are. Once all together, you get a scene that looks like this. And once that's done, you can layer it all together into one final video. You have your footage, you have your recorded audio, you have your background audio, and I also add music. I know it seems excessive, but for video editing, this is actually very minimal. Having all these different layers creates a world for a viewer to interact with. Again, it's all about making the audience feel like they're there, like this was really recorded. But once that's done, our last bit is color correcting. Color correction is definitely the last step of this whole process. And at this part, I usually just focus on making the footage look as real as possible, as well as making sure that my Pokemon pop out of the screen as much as they can, without breaking that realism, of course. This is through a lot of minor color correction and color grading adjustments, changing details in the highlights, making certain colors pop out more than others, and all that type of stuff. Once that's done, I edit some fine details into the video and I'm finally finished, except I also have to edit a version for TikTok, but that's a separate thing. Once that's all done, I export the full video, and then I make the thumbnail, which I have a template resolve for, and then upload the video for you guys to watch. And that is how I make these Pokemon animations. Believe it or not, that entire process usually takes me between one and a half and three weeks, and that change in time very much depends on which Pokemon I choose. To this day, Ghastly is still my most difficult project that I've worked on within the Pokemon series. That's mainly because all of the smoke animation was super complicated to figure out and very hard to render. In fact, I actually broke my render multiple times and even rendered over some frames and just completely messed it up a bunch of times. It was a very, very stressful time, but I finally got it out and I'm glad I did because it looks good. But then there will be easier ones, like the Magnemite episode. 
That video only took me about nine to 10 days to make. And by the way, when I say day, I do not mean like a full day of work. I'm a student and work part time. So I definitely only get to work like maybe maximum four hours a day on a Poke National episode, usually less than that though. So if I had the time to just sit down and focus on it, I could probably do a full Poke National in like five days if I worked straight through. But then again, I'm not sure. This is just my process. There's a lot of flaws and errors that could definitely be fixed. But overall, I like the way I'm working right now and I can definitely improve on it more and more as I go on. I'm so happy for the support and I'm really glad that everybody really likes the Poke National series. It is definitely one of the best projects that I've ever worked on and I'm so glad that a lot of people really like it. I will certainly keep working on it. I'm also working on other projects that you may or may not have seen popping up here and there. I'm definitely feeling the itch or it's just kind of like the urge to restart and revamp the anomaly report series and some of you may have noticed the concept animation i made for mike and the mushroom which is definitely an idea that i have bouncing around in my head and i even have live action concepts that i want to try so i hope that i can keep entertaining you all while making poke national and expand to other things at the same time but of course that's a lot i still have another year of school until i finish so i have a lot of things that i gotta do first i hope you guys will keep supporting me and i'll keep making as much stuff as i can for you until then i think i'm gonna hit it with a classic outro real quick i've been elias of elias entertainment Bye bye <laughs>